Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod where the Springboks come out and get another win. And we ask the question, what is the real difference between these two sides? The Springboks are obviously better at closing out these games. They're obviously a better team, having won four in a row. We're going to have a good look into why. Also, the Australians. What happened there? They absolutely fell apart in Argentina. Plenty to chat about there. We'll look forward to the big women's game this weekend as well. The Black Ferns against England at Twickenham could be the biggest turnout in the history of women's test rugby. And there's the small thing of wet ball gate to get into. Is that what we're calling it? Is that, is that what we're calling it, Jim? Wet ball gate? Oh, I've only just recovered. <laughs> Oh, I was just adamant the, the Battle of the Bridge was, was coming over to the North Shore, but not to be. <laughs> if you missed it, wet ball gate involves one Bryn Hall. Oh, oh and I've got a free kick here. Bryn Hall went to change the ball. It was all in the balance. Bryn just wanted a dry ball, and the ref didn't want him to have it. Bryn, what's going on? Oh, I... I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. I think, to be honest, Ross, we, we laugh about um, gamesmanship. And I think the, the Auckland halfback, if you talk around gamesmanship, it was, um, it was pretty world class. So, yeah, look, it was, it was, an, it was an unfortunate thing, I think. Um, the funny thing is that I actually have done it like my whole career. Um, and I actually did it two or three times during that game. But, um, look, sometimes when there's a bit of pressure and whatnot, and there was a, a little bit of commentary from the Auckland boys, which is good in terms of the gamesmanship. So... Um, yeah, they were able to, to get the, the free kick call and, and we could have been, we still, we still had the opportunity to shut it out. So, but yeah, myself and myself and Shooter, we had a bit of a, had of a chat with the ref after, but yeah, it was all uh, uh, don't, obviously. Don't you worry, that came across loud and clear on Sky. <laughs> <laughs> no one missed yep, that yep. conversation. You're, you're already on the way over there. I didn't realise you left. Yeah, but it's, it's a yeah. big call. A it's a city city like the I agree, the game's flowing great. No one's tried to waste time. We're, just, we're, we're, not, trying to, we're not trying to waste time. time. Why did you swap the ball? It's time off, Dylan. Why did you go to swap because the ball? Because it was weird. You could have just told me and said, like, mate, just come and don't do that. Mate, it's it's time haven't called time back on. I will agree with you, though, Bryn. Um, just as players do research on referees, uh, maybe he should have done some research on you because he is the most fidgety person. I, it used to frustrate me when I played with him. He'd be off getting a ball and we're trying to set a scrum and uh, get the call and get ready. So he, he definitely likes that ball to be perfectly dry. Yeah, in case you're not in New Zealand and you missed this, Auckland versus North Harbour. Brenner gets pinged. Unfortunately, the game goes the other way and there was some, some very terse conversations. Now... I, I had a chat with Chris Pollock, the head of New Zealand referees, um, this morning, just to catch up and see what was going on with it. And and instead of you know telling me more about the incident, he had a pitch for you. He said he, he wants you to sign up as a referee next year, and it's time to <laughs> register. <laughs> I actually rang him Funny Saturday enough, night actually, yeah. too, Brenner, and he said the same thing. <laughs> the man wants you. Yeah. It. Yeah. Well, Paulie has that, has had a few words with me and. Um, I guess in the last couple of years, because I, I tend to co commentate quite a bit. So, um, but yeah, look, man, look, players make um, split decisions, refs make split decisions. And the biggest thing for me in my learning is around is being able to maybe have the conversation and say, look, I'm going to go dry the ball now. But um, yeah, it's it's one of those things. And, and unfortunate, it's an unfortunate thing for us, but we've got to be able to take it on the chin. And, you know, hopefully for myself now, I'll be a little bit better in those situations and being able to, to get the result and take it away from the ref's hands and being able to, to get it right. <laughs> and the Auckland players spraying the ball with a water bottle is just next level. Like, well, there was there was quite a break in play, and, and um, <laughs> I remember watching it on TV, and I thought, geez, that's very kind of him that he just gave you the ball, like, very generously, <laughs> right before the scrum was about to be set. Um, but, yeah, it was all a game. <laughs> so, between that, the international rugby, and, of course, your questions, uh, YouTube comments section, and your emails at aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz. We'll give away another Gilbert Ball, courtesy of our friends at Players Sports throughout the show. But let's get straight into the big thing. The Springboks chipper against the All Blacks. Another tough watch towards the back. The All Blacks once again lose their lead and lose the game. What's going on there? What, what needs to change? Oh, I think you, we've got to give a little bit of appreciation um, to the opposition we're playing. and mm. The fact that they've got a lot of experience across their squad. Like They don't have a, any real inexperience across their squad, barring one or two players. But in particular, in the back end of the 20 minutes, and if you look... 
Yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if you look when we were just as successful as, as they were between 2015 and 16, um, there was a genuine focus on 23. And you almost, when you had that role on the bench, you knew you were going to be on a bench. You couldn't really force your way into the starting team because that's how your style of play um, worked. And there was almost like a bench captain as yeah. such. It was, it was another sort of... Um, I, I suppose team in itself and, and it's a very important part and, and they obviously knew and had confidence that um, they could still come back from where they were. Um, we tactically changed and we made some improvement that was, was great to see um, and I think most importantly in and around the breakdown like our tackle selection and our ability to get turnovers like we won the turnover battle against the Springboks which I don't think we've done for a very long time so that was a great shift from the week prior where we got turned over a hell of a lot ourselves we almost did what they did to us um, a lot of the time but I'll go back to um, you know you could probably just copy paste from what I said last week is Put the last 20 minutes to the side, and I think if you look at the first 40, similar to Ellis Park, we left a lot of opportunities out there then that could have put a lot of pressure on that um, impact from that bench to mm. play catch up, and um, because we weren't able to capitalise on those opportunities, and, and for a lot of it we took the three points, which was a change. You know, everyone's like, oh, why are we taking the three points? And it's, it's, you know, it's not what we should be about. It was only a week ago we kicked to the corner and scored a try and then other, other times we kicked to the corner and didn't get it and people have a problem with that. So you've got to keep everything in perspective is that they, the leadership group would have met, the coaching group would have met, and that was clearly their tactic is let's try and win this game by, you know, sort of putting that scoreboard pressure in threes. Where that fell over is the missed kicks. Um, because going into that half time, I think everyone here would say we were pretty confident. Mm. You know, we're ahead, we're dominating um, in and around that breakdown, as I say. Yes, we left some opportunities out there, but the game was still in our control. Um, and I feel both those games were in our control and it was our um, execution and, more importantly, our discipline in certain parts of the field. As I went quite hard at the Wallabies, um, you know, the check on Colby just gives them such an easy kick into that 22. And we know, um, although that we're very strong in that more defence, um, you know, they, they are big physical men. They will eventually break you down. Mm. Bryn, six entries into the 22 and collecting threes the entire time, or, or not collecting them as the kick may be, do you feel like that is, is a sound thing to do in modern international rugby when scoring from malls appears to be quite prevalent? Yeah, it is, but I think it comes down to feel on, on the game. Like, like sometimes... People might be thinking the seven going for the corner is the best option, but when you're on the field and how you're feeling and the feel of the game is really important of what your decision making is. And so, look, we were nine three, nine three up going at half time. We had a few opportunities to be able to score tries, not from line out malls, but having opportunities to score points that we weren't able to. Um, but in saying that, I think the the losing of the losing of the game for us is probably just after half time in that. 40 to 60 minute mark. We It was the most time in that quarter that we had the most penalties. We had five and we weren't able to score actually in the second quarter of that second half when Willie LaRue ends up being sent off and we weren't able to ca um, capitalise through the points and win with him off. And so, and then from that, the 10 minutes in turn of where the game was, was lost as well, where we weren't able to execute under pressure in multiple areas of our game that we needed to in pressure situations. And you look at Malcolm Marks' try, Jipper always touches, touches on it. It's like, it's going to bite you in the ass eventually when you give them the, those ample opportunities inside the 22. And look, our defense of line and was really, really good. They actually didn't get a lot of power out of it. We were really consistent and disciplined in terms of stopping those malls. But look, you get one opportunity, you go around a little bit. Um, TJ Pedernata hits that mall because it's going forward really close to the line. And Severus is just off, just a touch. And then he goes down that short side. So the margin of errors for us is really, really small. And so those kind of time frames that I use in examples which probably leads to um, the opportunities of us not being able to, to get that result, unfortunately, on the weekend. There was clearly a change in tactic in our penalty strategy. Um, although that, you know, Bryn's right, there is feel on the ground and so forth, but you have to feel, even when Damien took that one from 56, which I was surprised Geordie didn't step mm. up for that one, um, they really went in with that mindset of um, accumulating in threes, and and I suppose it, it came back to bite them. You know, even if I think even if we'd got them all, we wouldn't have um, still been able to, I, I suppose, win. But it's it's a catch twenty two. But I always think if you make those plans in a calm, you know, considered mindset, you ha you do have to naturally back that on the field. Um, but I suppose when that yellow card you know, sort of 
he went off the field, maybe that was the time to get into the corner because we've been pretty effective mm -hmm. against the Springboks with our driving mall as well. Um, but maybe it was because we'd had so many opportunities in the 22 in the first half, felt like we hadn't been able to break them down that, that they wanted those points. I'm not too sure. What I find really interesting when the All Blacks kick for the corner is I feel like they take less care to try to get it towards the five metre line than the Springboks do. The Springboks are very aggressive at kicking right in towards that has corner post. For and them. it has backfired for <laughs> them. But the All Blacks almost seem like sadaisical. Like they don't mind it going 15 metres out, which obviously doesn't provide as much pressure on the opposition. Well, I don't think they see their maul as, um, as dominant, I suppose, as a force, is the only way that they have that ability to score the try in that situation. Like sometimes actually having 15 metres, that between that 15 to 22 metres and you've got your attack structures, having that, I suppose, that gap. Room to move. A room to move. The defence line doesn't have that ability to shoot on you. So you don't actually want it that close. You want to sort of have your eggs in both baskets. And I think for the style of play, that suits the All Blacks. Um, but for the Springboks, they're either going to maul and then they're going to pop off and then they're going to go to work. And, and that's, that's how they go about their business. Whereas the All Blacks, yeah. as we saw in Alice Park, they had like to come from a lot of depth, create that space and hopefully score on uh, and, and on the corner. I suppose on the flip side of that, there's the building pressure thing, Bryn, where obviously when you get down within that five metres, that's when you start forcing the penalties. And if you look at the All Blacks, out of the 13 penalties conceded, 11 of them are when they're on defence. You look at the Springboks, yep. they actually concede more penalties on attack and I presume that's from opposition trying to get turnovers, but they concede more on attack than they do on defence, and that, I suppose, is when pressure builds on the All Blacks, when you're back-to-back -back penalties on defence. You look at where we've had our penalties in the last two test matches, test matches against the South Africans, it's been in that second half period. Like We had five on the weekend in that third quarter, which was the most that we had, and then in tight situations, again, when you're given opportunities at back ends of back ends of games to be able to go to their line out more or might even be using their forwards around the corner, which they're very, very good at in that 22 metre zone, you've just got to be able to try and stay on in those moments. And to South Africa's credit, when the game has been tight, they've been able to go to their DNA in terms of being able to make it really clear, line out more with Malcolm Marks. We always we saw Grant Williams last week, even though it was a back scoring, they went around that corner and got into that 22 metre zone with that kind of mindset of, right, this is our DNA and we're going to score points off it. So, um, and we've, you know, for the All Blacks as well, um, it's been able to take a, probably an understanding of how the, the ref is officiating it as well. When you get an 11 or 12 penalties from defensive errors, you know, you're hoping to think that you can drive solutions around, look, boys, we've given away X amount of penalties defensively. We need to be squeaky clean and be able to talk around what, what that's looked like. So, uh, but obviously as well, look, I thought the All Blacks played really, really well. Again, you know, the two test series, they've obviously lost, but, if they look at deeply in terms of watching their game, look, the line-out defense was really, really good. We know how good their line-out maul is. I don't think they scored a line-out maul, even though they did win off a little bit with Malcolm Marks. Their scrum set piece, you know, there was not a lot of dominance in terms of the South Africans being able to get really easy penalties collectively a lot of times during the test match. And our and our top tackle and our breakdown work was outstanding on the weekend. Tupo Vai, Cody Taylor, Sam Kane in and around that area. And, and lastly, our attack, our game line percentage was at 40, just over 40% which is our best game line percentage of the year. So these are all areas that we were really good against the South Africans that we touched on and thought, could we get the game line right? Could we use our ball in air? And we were able to do that with Damien McKenzie, Bowden Barrett in the first test match and even instances on that test match on the weekend, being able to get out to wit. So a lot of positives, but the, probably the learning and the solution is the last 10 minutes of the game. When the, when the game's really, really tight, the decision-making and making the right decisions and the execution to be able to do that in high pressure is probably something the South Africans were a little bit better in the last two test matches. Yeah, they've had more experience, and as we said, that pays a lot of dividends. But even looking back, when we had the likes of White Whitelock, Ritalik, um, Aaron Smith, um, Richie Mwanga, we still lost. You know, like so, I think everyone's been a little bit critical, hypercritical of the bench and some of the players that are starting, and um, so I, I think. I agree with Bryn, there was a lot of growth in our game. I know people aren't going to accept that, um, which is fair enough, and I'm all for that because I think that's that's our strength. Um, however, where the South Africans are, are very, very smart, um, they gave away seven penalties in the second half, we gave away eight. Mm. Like, it's not a big difference, but it's where they give them away. Mm. They're very calculated about where they... It's normally right close to their line or it's right further out. They don't, they don't get in that territory in between because they don't 
try to accumulate through desperation in their D that leads the ref to be thinking yellow cards. I think the Sia Khaleesi try came about because we were under heavy penalty pressure and that fear of a yellow card just didn't allow us to probably push the envelope at breakdown time, which didn't allow us to slow the ball. And when you've got those big bodies in motion, even though they're up against big bodies, you don't have time to get set, you don't have time to sort of double team them. And they have that ability to sort of come around the corner and get between two defenders, which just means you're eventually going to get there. Mm-hmm. But no one was stopping them, you know, sort of deadpan or, or driving them back. But it's because we were probably a little bit too cautious in around that breakdown to allow our D that opportunity, if that makes sense. Because that mall wasn't going anywhere, because they made four metres in six attempts across that mall, I kind of felt like actually they went away from it quite quickly. Like it might have been part of their strategy. Hey, look, we've sucked these people in now. Let's but, let's go elsewhere. This is not our only option at a mall time. No, but also respect to the week before. Yeah. Like the All Blacks fronted up Mall D throughout this whole tour. Mm. And and I think that's a credit to them. But like with any system, when you are fixated, you know, on trying to stop something, it does leave you potentially a little bit slower to react or um, that fixation, it meant TJ Perinara came in to make sure it wasn't a mall try, but then that stresses the defensive system somewhere else. So, um, you know, every action has a reaction. I, I mean, I don't need to tell people that, but those sort of small margins at the moment, South Africa are very patient and very calculated about how and when they take advantage mm. of it. So, Brenna, how do the All Blacks build to create those small margins going in their favour rather than the opposition favour? Is, is this a time thing? Is this a personnel thing? You, what is it that gets them over the line in these two games instead of behind it? It's experience, and Chip, you've touched on it a lot in terms of the, not the bomb squad, but the reserves that do come on have been together for a long period of time. So the confidence that you've had, the amount of work that you've done, whether it be through the trainings, the communications, the conversations, you know, generically for a long period of time, you get confidence with it. And knowing for myself, being in teams that you've had a lot of success with in the time and the years that you've spent together, you just feel confident and it's, it becomes very um, instinctual and decisive in terms of your decision making. So I just think for this group in the last, these last two test matches, that area um, and those guys that went through that experience will be a lot better knowing for the back end of the year and the future uh, future years that um, they experience the hostile environment in a furnace, in a furnace like. Um, and the only thing is they're going to get better from, from that experience moving forward. But Bowden Barrett and TJ Perinata are two of the most experienced bench players doing the rounds. Well, Bowden's already there. done it against England. Like, yeah. Stop being yeah. fixated. Everyone's fixated on one moment. Like, yeah. Yeah, Malcolm Marks was poor last week, but no one's talking about it because they won. Yeah. Like, it just everything just needs to be put into context. I, I think what we can control is get a bit... There's so much information that's gone in in terms of how the All Blacks are going to play that as a team and as a squad, that's not in their DNA yet. They don't know... Like, they're not solid on this is who we are. Like, the Springboks have been together and around coaching group, everyone. They know who they are. They know how they're going to play and they don't go away from it. That's... That's what happens when you have a squad and a team together for that long. In and around a lot of our decision making, that high percentage play mindset and, and that prior planning to be really clear on what we're trying to achieve is, is massive. And I suppose 56 metres out, not at altitude, is that a high per- percentage play to go for a, for a shot at goal? Or do we back ourselves that the week before we went into the corner and we scored a try? Mm. Although I know we highlighted that it potentially would have been penalised in other games with Lomax going around, but it's still an efficient platform for us to go and score points. Um, and, and it felt like we were just fixated on and crawling that scoreboard by threes that it blinded us from what was actually happening or that feel, as Bryn talks about, in the game. We made some major calls. I did not see that team coming. Like, yeah. that, that, the way that that team was named. And I know it was through a tactical shift, but it was a lot of change. Wallace Satiti was impressive. Massive. Like, probably to the point, um, you know, he probably doesn't, if Ethan's fit, you can't really drop Ethan, but he's, it's, it was the first sort of loose forward trio mix for me. Like, Sam Kane had, um, he had 30, uh, 45 rucks. Um, and then between Wallace and Artie, they would have had probably about 22 total. So that balance is good. People look at that and it's like, oh, it should be... But Sam Kane had three carries, whereas Wallace and Artie had 15 and 10. But again, that, that... And Sam made the bulk of the tackles. 
But that balance was that balance that we got so used to with a Jerome Kaino at six, um, and probably with a um, with Shannon Frizzell, you know, at the World Cup, and and that ability, man, the way he got across the gain line when he was carrying was so impressive and his little yeah. short footwork to get out the other side, those little dents he made in that South African defence. Um, but unfortunately, we made them tackle at 80% but didn't score a try. So that last yeah. skill execution really, really hurt us. I mean, put into the cauldron in terms of like your first start test match against the number one team in the world and I thought he held himself nice and I think it took him a little bit of time more so defensively in that first 20 minutes with the tackling but once he got over that kind of initial uh, 20 minutes I thought he was outstanding and then you know there's probably going to be conversations around you know does Will is Will better off in the wing or is he better off at fullback because I think on the weekend probably expecting Will to be more a little bit um, involved in the game but it probably just didn't come to him in terms of because the South Africans went to, to that contestable game and went a, and got a lot a lot of pay out of that and not been able to obviously get into those long kick battles and so you know that's where Will's strengths are so there might be a conversation around does Will go into 14 and keep Bowden at 15 because I thought Bodie came on really well but then as well um, Bodie's really good coming on that last 20 minutes which I thought he did some great things as well so um, those are probably the, the couple of the positions that, that I would probably probably question you've got Caleb Clark as well probably another one who I thought was really good when he played um, in his last test match but I think the crux of the, the spine I think won't change as much, but there might be a few tinkers in terms of like what kind of team that they are playing or how they feel that they might need. Look, they would, you know, they pretty much changed their whole back three. We, we talked about it on our, on our WhatsApp group. We weren't expecting the changes in and around that. So I don't think this coaching group will be um, afraid, depending on who they are playing. Guys will get opportunities in certain positions where they feel they might need a, um, a type of player in that position. We did a lot of contestable kicks as well. And if, and if you look at, I suppose the personnel, like, like a Will and a Caleb, it worked because that suits their game. Whereas I suppose I think of Mark and Seva as more those cross-field attacking kicks, sort of flat. You don't get in that aerial battle because they've got that ability to beat defenders at will. Both of them are, are, are both slippery. So it's, it's then, you know, do you look at um, if contestable kicks are going to be massive and if contestable kicks are going to be where, I suppose, sides think they can target us, there, there are, I suppose, players, you know, playing, you know, use Sean Stevens as an, as, as an example. He's very good aerially and his ability on the wing and his, and his ability, I, I suppose, in the air um, potentially could come into the mix. Are they going to change the squad? No. But if, if we don't, if we're going to stick with that sort of back three, then I would have thought, you know, you'd you'd back their fitness and their ability to get down the field, you know, even at the end there, rather than doing the contestable, could have we gone long and just backed our defence to force an error or, you know, force a penalty or, or whatever it may be versus, you know, something that sort of played into the South African's hand. I'm, I'm not too sure, but these are the things they need to make um, decisions on and then understand, OK, that's, that's what we're good at. That's how we're going to play them. You've got to pick and select around that. So please send us through more of your emails, aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz. We attempt to get through as many of them as we can along the way. We hold some for later sometimes if they're bigger picture questions and we'll eventually try to get to them. Question, maybe related to what Jip said earlier from Isaac October, and Isaac will give you the Players Sports Gilbert Ball this week for your question. He says, all I've heard since before the last World Cup is how good the box are and how they deserve to be number one. Every interview I keep hearing, they're the best in the world. This is all our players here every day. So is it any surprise that we implode against SA? Perhaps we're paying them too much respect. Our boys have the skills to beat everyone. What's missing is belief that we can. We'll smash Aussie because we believe we can. Do you buy into that? Is that the kind of conversation that will happen within a squad? No. Are they reading the papers? Are they getting that on their feeds on Instagram? It's about putting yourself in the very best position to be able to deliver what you can control. You can't control the opposition. Yes, you need to understand and you need to know what's coming, but you've got to control what you can control, and that's you, your preparation, your team's preparation, how you're going to play and execute under pressure. A lot of that, you know, there is a mental element. Maybe there are... Um, certain individuals that um, you know think they're number one, but it would be a little bit silly not to be realistic. Like uh, you know, you've, you there's the, always been that element of respect, even when the All Blacks have been on top. Um, it doesn't matter if you're playing, you know, a Uruguay at the World Cup or in a World Cup final against the, the Springboks. It should it 
my belief and my understanding of all my experience um, in and around the teams I've played for is it shouldn't look any different. If it does, that's a concern. Um, is that really the case? Oh, I don't believe so. Brent, when you're playing against a team like that, your preparation goes a little bit deeper, knowing in turn with what's coming. And so you actually have those conversations, you're... Your training's a little bit harder. You're within your own preparation, right? You know, yourself internally, and then once you get yourself done internally of what it looks like for you, you're having conversations with groups that you need to. But look, I, they would have been throffing in the mouth to be able to get an opportunity to go over to South Africa and try and get it done. But again, like what what Jip said, the last you know a few moments and high percentage players, and when you're needing to be able to um, execute under pressure, it's just one thing that we weren't able to get right in two test matches. And the the, the margin of error we've touched on with a lot of other teams, we've talked about it with. With Australia, with Argentina, the, the fine line of margins that they need to be able to get wins against top tier teams. We're just in a position, we're probably not at that extent with, with how long a game has to be, but you know, a fine margin of five to 10 minutes or a span of three to four minutes, that's kind of where we unfortunately lost the test matches in, in the last two weeks. I just think it's trying to, it's just grabbing. It's reaching for something. It's reaching for, for <laughs> a solution or just to, 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 to fill the frustration of the loss. Mm. But I think it, you have to tip the cap to the opposition. It's not all about us. Like, they, they will go down potentially in South African history as the best team that's, that's run over a span of, of time. And, and Sia Khaleesi will go down as probably the best captain. We know how um, heroic some of the South African and Springbok captains, but what um, he and Rusty have managed to do together with a lot of other people supporting around them is, mm. is phenomenal. It's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Brent, I'm interested in what you touched on before about, you know, those, those moments, those 50-50 moments, those fine margins. If doubt starts to creep in... Collectively as a team, if you feel, again, that that momentum isn't with you, you know, we see it today with a lot of players. They come into a circle, whether that's in a mini unit, the forwards are together in one circle or the backs are together in one circle or collectively you're in a circle as a team. That's when you can be able to um, collectively see someone, get your eyes and be able to have a deep breath, which you see in, in most in most teams. But from that, it's the messages that you are giving in those situations to try and get into that next task. So if it's emotion, for example, and you're saying, boys, we just need to be more physical and like let's let's just get our heads, our, our mindset right. That's not really giving you a solution and really trying um, circumstances. So, you know, it might be, boys, we're really, really struggling in, in this contact area for the last like last five to six minutes. So I need you to get your body height really, really low and I need you to hold your feet, get a bit of footwork and our cleaners, both sides of the ball carrier, I need you to get nice and low and clean these guys out a metre and a half. So then it's a solution and you know as a player, right? okay, we're losing this part of the area, I don't know why we're losing it, but then when someone gives you that solution, you can see it and hear it, you're like, okay, right, that's what I'm looking for in that next four to five minutes and that's just an example. So those conversations will be happening, be happening in a big group or maybe between players that are walking to lineouts or walking to scrums and talking on the run around what that solution kind of looks like to try and at least then in pressure situations, you know what you're doing and then it's on you as the individual to go out and try and execute that. It's also like we've spoken about at length last week. When I say preparation, like it's not just a word, it's recreate what makes you feel pressure. Recreate your mistakes. Do it time and time again. I find that really interesting because I've spent an entire career talking to sportsmen and constantly being frustrated by being told it's just about the process. And I'll be like, what's the process? And they'll be like, that's for us to know and you to find out. <laughs> and, but, I, you know, I can see how... It is specific to it's a person, though. Very, very... It's because yeah. Michael Jordan made up... And I'm trying to use examples that are out there that people understand. I'm not trying to hide from rugby examples, but it, it's Michael Jordan made up, like, that a player said something poorly about him. Yeah. Because if someone didn't back him and, and said he wasn't the best in the world, he took that personally and that made him a better athlete. That made him more ruthless. It made him, you know, even if he made a mistake, he was still coming for you and it was personal and that's what got him going. But for some people, that would derail them. Mm. They'd be chasing you around the field trying to smash you and then they'd miss their role over here. So <laughs> you've, you've got to make sure you understand who you are and what you stand for and, and how you tick to then create the process. Like, each individual has their process. I know, Ross, you're like, oh, process, like, process, process, but if you can go next task, and it's more like a, you're like a robot, really. You, don't, you aren't fixated on outcome. You're just fixated on being able to do what you can do in those moments, and if you're not getting it right, what's a solution? How can I find myself be able to get on the next task and continually go like that? Because there's so much emotion in your game. 
sometimes you're not going to get things right. And the, the, the more times you start to be able to like play on emotion and feel, that's when you really start getting yourself in trouble. And like guys like Jip, if he sees that emotion from other players, he's like, oh, we've got him. We've got him in the red. And that might be five minutes that he might need to be able to try to execute a pass, a line out, a scrum, and you get a penalty or a knock on done against you. So habits is bloody crucial in anything. They need wins though as well. Like as individuals, you need to execute it under pressure in a game, on TV, with people. But it's when you do that, you you highlight that, you understand that, you have that as a clip, that when you are challenging yourself for confidence... You know you can do it. Let's go back and have a look at how good you are. Like, mm. so many mm. times, when you're struggling for form, you're so fixated on the solution that you, you, you almost overthink, you know, how to get out of it, whereas, you know, I heard, I heard um, Cooper Cronk um, say a few years back, and I, and, and I really liked the way he articulated it. He goes, I used to go back and watch all my awesome games. And he goes, I just sit there, geez, I'm good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. and, and that makes logical sense because for him to get his confidence back is just that visual reminder. You know, for other people it will be different. But like, what, what I think we're trying to say is as a team, you need to know how you want to play and what your DNA is. Mm. And then as an individual, you need to know how you best fit into that and what you need to nail. What are your big rocks? Yes, we want to improve in little areas as individuals, but what are your big rocks that feed into that? South Africans have that down pat. Make no bones, they will not have 10 turnovers in their next test mm. at the breakdown. They won't allow it. They, Rusty will be like, that is average. Yep. You know, you've seen all those things on Instagram about playing for South Africa and, you know, what it means to them. You know, he'll be able to put up all those turnovers and go, are you putting yourself on the line for South Africa in this ruck? Certainly it seems with the Springboks that that sense of doing duty for their country is just ginormous. Speaking of the big rocks and how it allows them to do other little things, we got an email through from Damien Jones, which is a really interesting one. Um, he goes into a bit of detail. I've cut it down slightly, but uh, he says at 47.51, this is on the game clock, South Africa has an attacking line out on the AB's line. Malcolm Marks has the towel in hand to throw. He then transfers the ball to Colby, who appeared to be positioned as the receiver, the halfback at the uh, lineout. SA had eight players in the lineup because Marks went there and Colby threw in. Phases after that, Sia Khaleesi scores. Should there be a halfback? When is a line out formed? Should this have been a penalty? So many questions around that Colby throw in. When is a line out formed? So I got on the blower um, to a referee and, and asked that question. And the basic answer to that question is when there's at least two players from each team and a hooker in place, the line out is formed. So technically, that change late shouldn't have been allowed to happen. And saying that, jeez, great idea. And the fact they get away with it, give it a crack. Yeah, and the hard thing with that, it's, you know, we saw something similar, but not as late a change against Australia. I think just putting myself in my players, because these things happen all the time mm. at line out. Um, you know, we've had previous years where the guy at the half comes in to lift and, you know, a player doesn't exit. So now there's the rule that if someone comes in, someone must uh, remove. They can have as many numbers as they want. They don't need the half back. It was the lateness of the switch, but that was purposeful, as we know. Yeah, that was part um, of the show. That, that is, however, when I look at it from a defensive set, we were down to defend them all. So I don't think we would have added a number. Okay, and I feel like if it was uncomfortable, they felt that pressure, you'd say something. Whenever there's late change, especially at a line-out, normally there's someone that has that role to say, hey, ref, late change, you've got to give us time, or is it a free kick, what's, what's going on here? And you see it time and time again about you'll hear line-outs start roaring and, you know, and, and it's all there to put the ref under pressure to make a decision. I felt, when you look at that, they were comfortable. And they stopped them all, and as I said before, it wasn't so much that... Whatever happened there didn't mean Khaleesi scored that try. It was more that the penalty pressure they were under just didn't allow them to be as physical and dominant or push the envelope at those breakdowns. But a free kick would have meant that try didn't get scored if it was awarded. Yeah, I just, I've, I've never seen a free, like they, they normally settle it down, that, you know, and not to make it about Bryn's situation, so often you'll see in refs, mm. in those big moments, they'll step back and say, guys, just calm down. Let's just reset, get the scrum down. 
Yeah. It happens at lineouts as well. I don't think yeah, yeah. I don't see any ref giving that a free kick. We just reset it and carry yeah, it. Yeah, just game. calm down. Okay, yeah. Colby, you go back there, Mark's throw in, you're not doing that. Or if you are New Zealand, you've got time now to adjust. Mm. That's what they normally do. Yeah. It was miss, but I don't I still don't think a free kick would have been given. And just to clarify the rule, law eighteen states there is a minimum of two in the line out but throwing team determines the maximum. So you can have as many people as you like in that line out of Oh, we've seen it. There's and no half back. Of... You can do as much as you like. There is no limit there. Chipper, his throw was right on the money. Think how many Pretty times they would have bro. practiced it. Um, but if you go back and watch it, I don't think it affects the All Blacks at all. Yeah. I think that penalty pressure was the big factor that was in the back of their mind. Yeah, having an extra person in the line out didn't stop them. It from actually suits the drive. Them. Yeah. If you look at it from a defensive act, uh, yeah. there's less bodies out wide that they have to defend. And even if they are to come back in, you can track them as a player because they've got to come from the blind and around. Now, there was another game on on the weekend, and that was <laughs> Argentina versus Australia. And it was Oof. something else to watch. Only last week we were saying... Is this a watershed moment for the Wallabies? You know, they showed guts in the rain. They got there in Argentina. And then Brenner, they just fell to pieces. A little bit. They fell to pieces with because the Argentinians and how they ended up playing. But look, I was looking at 20 to 3, and I was thinking, oh, this is like, geez, Australia are going to turn a corner. They're doing some nice things. But if you just look after that, it was an absolute avalanche of what the Argentinians did really, really well. Like, probably the first time, Jipper, that I've seen their scrum be that dominant in terms of being able to play on, on, on top of them. So I thought they were pretty impressive there. And then their interplay, because of their gain line success that they had, they were rocking at 52% gain line. We touched on the All Blacks at 40%, and the the South Africans are usually at that kind of 47, 48, usually. And they were on top of the Australians consistently. And I thought their skill set from their, from their big men, their loose four trio, probably Martita with a couple of good offloads, you know, Gonzalez, even um, Kramer as well, they were awesome in and around um, keeping the ball alive and using footwork and that attacking ability of their loose forward is really good. And lastly, their backs. Their ability to be able to square people up on the edge consistently for the majority of that match was, was so impressive to watch. And so it's not like the Australians on that attacking side um, were putting them under pressure, but their ability to be able to get the last pass, which you probably think with the All Blacks, we weren't able to score points in that in that game try-wise, but... The Argentinians were ruthless in terms of being able to get that ball to the edge, make the right decision, and that game line percentage, they just blew them off the park. Uh, didn't really give them anything. I think it was 20, it was 20 to 20 to 3, and then after that, they scored five consecutive tries before Tate McDermott scored his try um, off a quick tap. So, you know, you talk around momentum. Um, and one of the things that probably led to that is that they only had two penalties post the 21st minute. So we talk around Discipline um, been a big area of work on for the Argentinian teams. They got three in that first 20 minutes, but then post that to have two penalties in, in a 60 minute, 59 minute span, um, it seems like it's a good DNA mix if they can get that right for the Argentinian team. If you look at Argentina, where they got that massive game line from was they were playing pop touch. Like they didn't clean rucks. Mm. They would literally just bend the defence on the edge and they'd just pop it up. And then that, that player would go through the middle, they'd go to the other edge pop it up, pop it up, and, and you just can't, you know, I was talking about the All Blacks not being able to get set even when they had some time. Like the Australian defence just could not get set, and, and a lot of it's around their tackle choice. So they're, they're not going low, but they're not going on the ball, and then they're riding tackles, which takes them across the game line, and then once they're going, they're not like sort of releasing to try and get on the ball because of that dominance, which is allowing that pop, um, so I think their tackle choice was, it just went backwards massively, but I do think you, you, um, you said watershed moment for them. I think the water actually helped them defensively the following week, which, mm. which helped their result. But, um, you know, Argentina played extremely well and, and they played that style that we know, that pop offload game that was freakish. But then also, again, with all their attacking opportunities, Australia had, they've, you know, and I celebrated them for their lack of rucks they played outside of their 22 or, you know, even between between the 22s the week prior. They just, the, I think 61% of their rucks was in between the mm. two 22s and um, 48 rucks between halfway and the 22 and they just don't kick, Bryn. Like, there's no attacking kick play. There's no, there's no fast ball. There's no pop touch. There's no, it's just... 
man, for a defensive side, it's just too easy and it's just putting too much pressure on guys to do something brilliant. You know, you look at the, the All Blacks in that second test match, how many attacking little kicks to be able to stunt that the defence that the Argentinians do have. They, have. they like to be able to bring a little bit of line speed. They like to zero ruck quite a lot. So you're going to see a lot of Argentinians that are in the line. And you look at Will Jordan in that second test match, even Bowden Barrett, sorry, um, Damien McKenzie being able to put those little chips early on just to maybe stunt that um, ability of that, um, that line speed pressure. So Don't you think, though, with those tight forwards, like I'm just thinking when you're not looking to tip and you're that tight and it's predictable... That's when you're expected to get a quick ruck. Yep. Not fight in the contact. Like, I don't know why they're fighting in the contact because you know that's what's coming. What I can't understand is, okay, just be a little bit submissive with the ball in hand and get that quick ball so a Gordon can come and whip it off the deck and then you can try and catch them off guard. But it's like they've, they've got that set up. And then they wrestle with them, which just feeds into your defensive hand because you can have that time to get set. It just... I don't know, it just does it. it, I can't work it out. When you think about the great Australian teams like Rod McQueen's Wallabies, they were really good at that. The Brumbies, so good at hitting the deck as the tackler came Pretty towards much. them. Pretty much. through, and then Gregan would have the ball because Larkin would just go. Or and he, Larkin's flat, and yeah. he's, you know, he's got bodies in motion, it's just. Yeah. Oh, and Finnegan's inside, whatever you wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I just, I just don't know why they don't kick. I agree. You know, even like in the one, the one in the wet, and this is the week previous day, they went through like thirty odd phases. So I think it's 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 marrying up an understanding of where you want to play, where you want to play your own. We've we've talked about this a lot with this um, Australian team, Jip. Like they seem to get it maybe a week where they might go a little bit more contestable. Because if you look at the the nines for the for the uh, for the Australians, the Reds and the Waratahs, predominantly massive contestable game. They don't get into. They get into that zone of the field, the, the the no man zone, and they're putting up contestable. Sometimes they even slow it right down. They get into a part of the field to be able to set it up, and then you can go on to be able to go into a contest, or you can go and blitz through and be able to slow down the ball. It's like, man, if you're a forward, I don't know, Jip, and you're going in the no man zone with with numbers like that, and you're getting no pay out of it. It's not like it's a defensive area that the team's making. It's just unnecessary work that you've got to be able to try and work in your attack shape, and you're getting no gains from it. Thinking about the Wallabies then, a couple of weeks away from Bledisloe Low 1 in Sydney, do they stand any chance? I think you have to acknowledge they do because at times they have played well. Um, but I, I'm confident in that all-black forward pack and the way we held up against Springboks. If they give as many opportunities as they have, like their scrum capitulated, Aussie scrum, um, their, their heart defence, you know, you talk about playing on the back foot or defending on the back foot was really poor um, in that test just been and has been against the Springboks. Um, you know, they, they'll need to make sure their discipline is absolutely picture perfect, that they don't give easy access into the 22 um, for the All Blacks. But they, I've said it even after the Springboks, they do have the cattle there and, and, and the ability to do so. Um, but they may need to look at the balance of their 23 um, because a Tanya Tupo actually against tiring bodies may, and an Angus Bell may be better and use the two veterans and Ala Latoa and um, Slipper to start the game um, and, and see what impact they can have in and around that. But, um, you know, it will definitely have the All Blacks going in as favourites. I probably want to see a dominant performance from the All Blacks, if I'm being honest. I think with the cattle that Australia have and the struggles that they've had against an Argentinian side, like, I'd be pretty... Not disappointed, but I think that's what we need as, a, as an all-black team to see what we probably saw against the Argentinians, the intent, um, the dominance that we showed and we were able to be. Uh, we looked like the more dominant team. So they'll go through everything they need to do. They'll respect the, the Wallabies um, and that. But for me, sitting back and watching this, I want to see it, the, the improvement that we've got against the South Africans and dominating um, this Australian team. Now, games in women's rugby don't get any bigger than the game that we've got this weekend coming up. England, the best team in the world, the most consistent team in the world, a hell of a powerful team at home at Twickenham against the Black Ferns. Earlier in the year, 58,000 turned up to watch England play against France. They're expecting more this time around. Probably going to be the biggest live crowd ever for a women's rugby test for the world champions versus the world number one. Last week, after the show finished, we had the chance to catch up with Steve Jackson, the Black Ferns assistant coach. He's had a bit to do with these blokes as well at <laughs> Harbour. And uh, he talked to us a little bit about this game and what they need to do to get over the line against a dominant English team.
with the WXV starting a couple of weeks later, can you talk a little bit about exactly what you need to achieve in this England game? What are you setting out to do? Make no bones about it. Um, you know, we lost to them in the WXV last year. Uh, they had a point to prove and, you know, we probably rested on our laurels a little bit in that game. Um, but again, you know, there's when you go out and play, there's always another 15 players on the field that are trying to do the same. So, you know, we didn't come, we were on the receiving end of, uh, you know, not a good result for us. And, you know, there's been, ever since then, we knew that this, that this game could potentially um, turn up and it has. Um, so we, we're, we're pretty excited. Look, we've trained pretty hard. Um, we've done a lot of work over the last sort of few weeks. You know, just come out of a camp, you know, three week camp where we, you know, all our, all our um, training and things like that were, were just about England. The line out more is a big area that they've been really good at. Um, that'll be some of the things that you're looking at to try and nullify that um, that set piece and how dominant they've been in the last probably you know two to four years. But again, we've looked at all that. Dan Cron's done some outstanding work for us in terms of the mall defence and, and even on our own mall attack. So, you know, we're going to use that as, a, as our weapon as well. Um, but we know where they're going to be coming, you know, with the influence of John Mitchell in terms of defensive stuff. Um, you know, Mike Delaney's done a great job in regards to our attack to try and find some um, holes in their defensive line. Um, but we're, we're quietly confident, mate. We've done a lot of work. Uh, we've prepared the, you know, the team really well. Um, you know, they had a week off, you know, and, and now we're looking at test week. So, you know, we're pretty excited. Just to go back to that line out more, I saw a stat that Marley Pack has scored 43 tries in 100 tests or something. Like, just that shows what it's like for them, really, you know, over a long period of time for her. When you look at your team encountering that, I suppose that the most important thing is not line out more defence at all, it's not letting them get there. You know, and because they've got such a good kicking game, you know, they, they don't play too much inside their own half. Um, they like to get down into into your territory and 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 make you make mistakes. Um, so you know we've got to look after the ball and, and cherish p position that we get because um, we know in these big matches you'll only get one or two opportunities when you've got ball in hand and you you've got to make them stick. Um, you know, and again, you know it's it's a huge occasion for us. You know, the the crowd's going to play its part. Um, you know, we believe that it's it's going to be a world record crowd there. Um, so again, it's something that our team hasn't experienced either. Um, so not only the game's going to be a big occasion, occasion um, playing at Twickenham in front of a crowd like that, um, it's going to be the same as well. What are you as coaches, how have you, have you been trying to get these girls to understand what it looks like with obviously not being able to do it? Yeah, look, we've, we've, we've done some things within our training, uh, within our gym sessions and things like that to bring some noise into into our environment. You turn up the stereo with, with the crowd or what's happening in the gym in order to replicate it? You know, plenty of noise, plenty of crowd noise, uh, every opportunity we can get. You know, Ian Saunders, our uh, mental skills coach, has, uh, has done a great job there in, in preparing, you know, our ladies for, you know, what may come and what's what's going to come. Um, but again, as I said, you know, we, we just need to make sure that, you know, th there's going to be a lot of emotion and how relaxed our players can be and, knowing that um, they, they can go out there and, and play the game that they want to play. I've been a, a former loose forward, Jackie. You must be stoked with the, the amount of loose forward um, depth that you have in your, in your squad. Obviously, with Olsen Baker coming back and you've got Saiti and Makaili Tu'u and Kennedy Simons there as well, especially with what's coming with that English forward pack and even the French, you must be pretty happy in terms of what you're getting out of your loose forward trio at the moment. Oh, extremely happy. And, um, you know, not just, you know, the talent that they have, but it's the, it's the physicality that we're really excited about. You know, um, all of our loose forwards at the moment, you know, are really hungry and, you know, there's a lot of competition there and there's a lot of competition within the squad. So selecting a team is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but that's what we want. You know, we want that competition and, you know, um, you know, part of what we're doing is trying to make sure that our players are competing every day. Um, so selections are going to be really, really difficult. Um, but yeah, we've got an exciting loose forward trio. You know, they're really um, robust. Um, they're good line out um, exponents. They're good with ball in hand, defensively sound. You know, and they like the aggression. They like the the lock. Like, they like the contact part of the game. So I'm pretty sure that you know, although we know that England are going to be coming around the cor corner, and that um, you know, our girls are going to welcome that. I think. Before we let you go, Bryn Hall, James Parsons, their time at North Harbour. I mean, I, I hear a lot of coach at week on week on week. The WhatsApp lights up, 
the show's on, the, the rugby geek element comes out of it. Can you give us an insight into what it was like to coach these two blokes? Yeah, how much time have I got? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you like. <laughs> Oh, look, mate, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a first year head coach and then coming into North Harbour and then obviously with Bryn and um, Chipper's experience, you know, it, it was it was awesome for me. Um, you know, they had a grasp on, you know, the team environment we were heading and that was one of the things that we worked really hard on when we were at North Harbour was that environment and culture. And when you got, you know, a couple of guys like those two um, in the positions that they played in, it was, it was really easy and it was a good transition for myself going from an assistant coach into a head coach. Um, but not only that, mate, you know, I'm probably blowing a bit of smoke here, but <laughs> just really good men off the field, you know, good good families and come from good backgrounds, mate. And, you know, they we we although we did some tough stuff on the field and on the training pitch, mate, we had some we had some good times off the field. And, you know, there was one thing that we knew how to do when we were at Harbour is, is have a laugh and enjoy what we were doing. And, you know, I think sometimes you can lose sight of that. Um, you know, the reasons why you play the game, but, you know, they're, they're, they're rugby through and through and, you know, um, not that I really enjoy that the clubs that they were playing for, you know, one's at North Coat and the other one's at Takapuna, um, not the two <laughs> best clubs in, in North Harbour. But, um, yeah, look, mate, they were fantastic. And I'll give you a bottle of wine there, Jacko, mate. That's the, those are the most positive things I've ever heard from you, my old mate. So I'll give you a bottle of wine and send it to Waiheke for you. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I think that's why. I get it. <laughs> well played. Get, get it in the fridge. <laughs> awesome, mate. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Have a great trip. Hey, no worries. Go well, men. Steve Jackson had plenty of good things to say about Brenner. <laughs> plenty it's because he's, it's he's abused the poor guy for so many years. He's he's <laughs> he's in debt. He's trying to get some credit back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you talk to the coaches the way you talk to the refs, Brenner? Oh, Jesus! This, this is going to be a new thing that happens every week, is it? Just something different that I can jump on now. So, no, it was probably around the other way. If I'm being honest, um, Ross, I was just um, put on my place from Jacko. So, no doubt he'd be doing the same with them. Um, you are very good with the refs. Like, it is a strength of yours. Um, that was probably the first time I've ever seen a ref fall out with you early in a game. Yeah, the, the frustration side of it. Probably you, do, you talk around emotion that we talked about a little bit of this earlier in the podcast that, you know, when results aren't going your way, you probably want a little bit more and you're a little bit more, um, I guess, trying to put a bit more pressure in that and whatnot. So great learning for me. Look, still being able to learn it at my age and understanding it, um, yeah, could have been a lot better in that space. So... I think it'll be a good learning for him as well, <laughs> just quietly. <laughs> There'll be no beers for him on the North Shore, I can assure you of that. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, we do have another big game this weekend. Tasman, having won the Shield of Hawke's Bay, are now going to face Wellington, a Wellington team that could be bolstered. Yeah, oh, you have to think. Um, and isn't it a beautiful sight, seeing the All Blacks get up early, um, and you saw Will Jordan, um, Ethan Blackadder, Dave Harvelli celebrate that kick. Um, and you say there's no connection with our top side down to our, uh, our community sides. I, I, I just think that... You see that enough to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But it's not just their team. Like, there was other players there. Like, that, the Ranfurly Shield's a beautiful thing. And, um, and I think, you know, sometimes provincial rugby does get a bit of a um, kick in the guts because of the crowds and stuff, but there is still a lot of energy and excitement in and around the competition. And, um, and I think it should come in droves this weekend now through the excitement of having the Shield. But you'd have to think, Bryn, Billy Proctor, Ruben Love and Dave Harvilli will drop yep. back for this game. You know, you talk around the NPC, those boys coming back, and every time you get a calibre, look, we've had Wallace Satiti, he, he came in, and the kind of boost that he gave our forwards and our group, you know, getting all back to come back. So... I know those boys will be chomping at the bit. It's hard when you're holding tackle bags and you just want to be able to get out there. So you're going to probably see a lot of um, energy in terms of those all-black boys coming back and try and, I guess, get the minutes, but staking their claim to be able to try and um, get some minutes for the all-blacks in a few few weeks' time. i tell you what, the way Wellington are going, though, how could you drop Clark or you know, <laughs> Umanga Jensen or Higgins? Um, so potentially they may have to come off the bench, the big dogs. You wouldn't want to stunt the rhythm that well and have going into the Shield Challenge. Yeah, yeah. So plenty of good games of footy coming up this weekend. We've got that huge game between England and the Black Ferns, of course. We've got Brenner playing for Harbour. We've got a full NPC round, an FPC round. Plenty to talk about. 
So thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We really appreciate you reaching out with your emails at aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz and also within the comments section, we try to get to as many as we possibly can. Of course, thanks to James Parsons once again for his insight. Thanks to Bryn Hall for being very patient and copying a lot of grief this week. <laughs> we appreciate it. Hey, as long as, mate, Ross, if you need me, if you need me for any of that, mate, just keep using me. And thank you to everyone who helps put this show together. We really appreciate it. Catch you next time. Matua.